Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I'm Lisa Phillips, and I want to welcome you to the sixth season of the Stuart Regan Visionary Series, a series honoring leading international thinkers and doers who are committed to enhancing the quality of contemporary life and shaping the future through their practice. Over the past six years, we've honored Bill T. Jones, Jimmy Wales, Alice Waters, Maya Lin, and Matt Wiener. Tonight, we're so proud to honor the critically acclaimed and extraordinarily gifted director, screenwriter, and producer, Darren Aronofsky. I'm especially honored to welcome you uh, because you're from Brooklyn and <laughs> because I'm a huge admirer of your films uh, like Pi, Requiem for a Dream, uh, Black Swan, and especially The Fountain, which I've seen at least 10 times. <laughs> so uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, you're no stranger to controversy, and um, your vision is uncompromising. These are values that we totally stand behind and um, stand for at the New Museum. So Darren will be in conversation with Lynn Tillman, outstanding author, writer, Guggenheim fellow, and friend <laughs> who has read a few times at the New Museum. We're happy to have you back. And thank you both for being here tonight. Uh, the series is made possible by Barbara Gladstone, who created a fund in support of it in honor of her son, Stuart Regan. Regan, who started his career as a chief uh, preparator at PS1, settled in LA in the 80s, where he opened a cutting edge gallery that championed the next generation of artists and was the first to show artists like Matthew Barney, Raymond Pettibone, Charles Ray, and Kathy Opie. While he was running the gallery, he also bought the film rights for John O'Brien's semi-autobiographical novel, Leaving Las Vegas, and was executive producer of that Academy Award-winning film adaptation directed by Mike Figgis. So he would be very pleased tonight. Stewart was an independent thinker, very reflective person, and loved the challenge of unconventional and creative minds. So Barbara, thank you for your generosity, for supporting the creation of this important series, and for all the support that you've shown the New Museum over the past decade. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce... Thank you. Thank you. And now I want to introduce Richard Flood, who is Director of Special Projects and Curator at Large at the New Museum who's been a driving force behind the Visionary Series. Richard, thank you. I would also like to thank my partner in crime, Johanna Burton, uh, who is uh, a wonderful person to work with and makes things just flow very, very smoothly. Um, I won't say who I am since uh, Lisa already took care of that very nicely. I do want to repeat something, which is I, I feel that Stuart would embrace our honoring Darren Aronofsky for this installment of the series. Um, it may be of interest to know that in, in 1990, Stuart bought the screen rights to John O'Brien's novel, Leaving Las Vegas, and became a producer for Mike Figgis's unflinching film adaptation. That Leaving Las Vegas is in the same cinematic family as Aronofsky's films is a fortuitous footnote. For an American director, uh, Aronofsky has had a very French career, making a film every couple of years, creating a body of work that is recognizably his own, telling stories that take normal to the unthinkable. With six films behind him, there is no doubt that like his peer Paul Thomas Anderson, Aronofsky is a bona fide auteur. His protagonists have, from the first film, Pi, been seekers and as often as not losers obsessives who are betrayed by their ambition and destroyed by their hubris. From the desolate drug-ridden lives of in a requiem for a dream to the monstrous isolation of Noah, Aronofsky portrays a world of almost biblical indifference. Yet lurking in his body of work, the possibility of transcendence can occur, as in The Fountain, his exquisite meditation on mortality. Then too, there's the, work of, the work's abiding humanity, Regardless of his characters, his characters' moral deformities, one feels that they are always and truly commanding Aronofsky's compassion. In conversation with Darren, 
we have the inimitable Lynn Tillman, a writer of great artistry, trenchant wit, and compelling curiosity. I know that she'll do me a favor and ask Darren how, how it was collaborating with Hubert Selby Jr. But mostly, I know that I can't wait anymore for the show to begin, so thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I wanted to uh, begin with a beginning, which Darren will know really well, and many of you will also, but I'm going to refresh your memories. In the beginning, when God created the <laughs> heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and darkness he called night. And that brings me to how the Bible works. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. And that brings me to how you have used the Bible in your work and the importance of beginnings in all of your, your films. And I, so I thought we, we should start with Pi, mm. where you started. And it begins with Max, Max Cohen, saying, when I was a little child or a little kid, my mother told me not to stare into the sky, into the sun, yeah. but he does. Yeah. And then he damages his eyes, but not forever. But something forever changed. Do you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's there's many ways to talk about it. Um, I guess there's the technical way. We we uh, we actually that wasn't in the original script that came afterwards. And um, his saying that him saying that um, it was a voiceover that Sean and I worked on for a long time as we were editing the film because we always felt there should be some type of um, way to get deeper into his head. And um, I think staring into the sun, it was probably my dad who told me not to stare into the sun because he was the scientist in the family. But I think everyone sort of has that connection and that memory about that. And it just seemed like the perfect metaphor about you know, um, wanting to do, I mean, because the sun is just so obviously part of our lives, yet it's the one thing we really can't look at. Um, and so uh, it, it is just something immediately poetic about that idea. He, um, he goes on to say, but it's also so much about film, mm -hmm. the use of light and looking at, thinking mm -hmm. about light in film, but he goes on to say that what changed was that forever after he had headaches. Yeah. Well, I think once again, we were just trying to connect it to the story at hand. You know, um, I get, you know, filmmaking's very sculptural. Um, in fact, when I was in, when I was studying as a student, at a certain point I realized I wanted to, st to start going into visual arts or as my parents called it, arts and crafts. <laughs> um, which is fair, you know, when they're paying for Harvard, it's a fair <laughs> critique. Um, but I started to go down that path, and um, uh, there was a, I had taken a drawing class sophomore year, which was fantastic. It was a great drawing teacher named Will Ryman, and um, he kind of changed the way, he just sort of changed the whole perception of how to look at the three-dimensional world and try to represent that two-dimensionally. Um, and so it was incredibly exciting. And, um, and then uh, the next year I was like, okay, there was a sculpture class I was interested in and there was a filmmaking class and I didn't get into sculpture, but I got into the film class. So that kind of chose my path. And um, I, find, I think they're very similar. I th end up thinking about film a lot like sculpture or even you know, tapestry, especially um, you know, uh, pie, because pie really was a lot of ideas that I had been thinking about through my 20s that they were all kind of the coolest things and ideas that I was playing with, and I sort of weaved them together into a fabric of ideas. 
And so it's really a snapshot of who I was mostly in my, you know, mid to late 20s leading up to that and, and sort of building this big tapestry together. So it was taking a lot of different ideas that had absolutely no relation to each other and figuring out how to make something um, blend and turn into something that was, you know, all connected. Cool. So a lot of things were pushed and pulled to make it work. So, you know, taking Hasidic mysticism and tying it with mathematics was a good start, but there are, is actually connections and it's just sort of emphasizing them and sort of pulling it together. The look of the film is pretty extraordinary. And I, when I watched it twice, three times, I kept thinking of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari mm. and other uh, German expressionist work. It. Yeah, it was a big touchstone for us. <clears throat> it came out of a budgetary limitation, which was um, I didn't think I had the staff or even the um, personal ability to work in color yet. And I thought there was something interesting about working in black and white. And when I was an undergrad, the first assignment they gave us was um, they just gave us a role of a black and white reversal film, which is something I don't think exists anymore on the planet. I mean, it might exist in Polaroid form, but it's, it's definitely a dying artifact of the 20th century. And it was, it's basically a film that has no negative. You basically, the same thing that goes through the camera, you process it and that's your final product. And it was something that, you know, was probably developed for home users mm -hmm. and hobbyists at the time. Uh, feature films weren't really made with it. But the quality of, of, of the film was incredibly um, high contrast. Yes. The negative just wasn't very sensitive. And so if something's a little too dark, it's instantly black. And if something's a little too light, it's instantly very, very white. And so getting the exposure right is, was a real headache for the cameraman. But I knew that it would immediately pull all of these different um, parts of this world we were you know, uh, working with together into something that was kind of cohesive. So it was kind of taking this big filter of the universe and putting everything through this black and white filter. And then the end result, it kind of fools people into thinking it looks it looks alike, even though it really wasn't that well controlled. It sort of helped us. Well, you use those incredible jump cuts and close-ups mm. uh, that make you feel as if there's some intimacy yeah. with a character who is going mad. Um, it was, I mean, it, that was another, once again, budget restriction. You mm. know, when, when I started thinking about Pi, I, I figured, hey, there must be a way I can raise $20,000 from people somehow to pull together. Um, it was funny because I'm teaching now to NYU, and I was like, how much do they charge you a year? It's $57,000 <laughs> a year to go to NYU grad school, which is how much Pi costs. I was like, something's weird about that. So, um, uh, so, they, so I figured, you know, I could do that, and what, you know, what can I really rely on? And one thing I could rely on was my one of my best buddies in school, who I thought was an interesting actor, Sean Gallet, um, who's married to Ito Barada, who had a piece just up here mm -hmm. at the New Museum. Um, anyway, so Sean, I knew I could depend on him, so I said, okay, we're going to do a film that's basically like my first assignment in film class. It's a portrait film of you. You're going to play a fictional character. It won't be a documentary. Um, Sean is just a terrible mathematician. He's like in, he's an incredible writer and a poet and a filmmaker now, but a terrible mathematician. And but I thought, um, you know, we'll try to shape a character out of you. Um, and uh, and so I knew I could rely on him. And so I decided to make a film that was this something I was exploring, which was subjectivity in film, which was, you know. I think early in film school, someone was pointing out um, what well, we were watching a movie together, and they said, oh, that's the first objective shot they saw. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they explained you know, this whole idea. And I started to thinking about the difference between theater and film is theater, you're really objective. You're just watching from the audience. And one of the beautiful things about film is that you can really put the audience inside of a character's mind. And um, so I think Pie and Requiem were really my exploration of of those ideas was how to make a fully subjective movie in Pi's sake purely from the point of view of Max. So we came up with all these rules about it. Um, and we, w what I love about rules is they actually help you save money because <laughs> once you have rules, you can't go and do that. You can make just 
that part of something. So for instance, um, you know, we only shot over Max's shoulder because that makes it part of his story. We never shot over one of the other people's shoulders. And when we shot Max, we kind of shot slightly more from a profile so that we were sort of objectifying him. And when we shot the people he was talking to, we tried to make the eye line as close to the camera so it was almost like a POV. And so the whole idea was trying to pull the audience as much impos as possible into this internal monologue. His, and, his world and always it was disorienting. You use some of those same techniques, not completely, with Requiem. Yeah, well that, that's what, when I read Selby's novel, <clears throat> it, what excited me is that he's such a subjective writer that he really helps you to, I mean he, it's all about the internal psychology of those characters. Um, and he's also very cinematic um, in, in the way he structures that book. But what was exciting is it was suddenly four POVs. Yes. And then that gave me, immediately when I read the book, I was like, OK, so their split screen doing that opening scene from two different point of views just made total sense. Um, as a kind of start, the visual language and the grammar I was going to use to tell the film is to you know show the same scene from two different characters at the same so at the same time, which is something you can't do when you write a novel. Unfortunately, you might try, but yeah. it always is sequential. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that split screen. No one's ever so tried to blend it. Um, well, you can blend it, but yeah. not in the same way. You can't. Right. You can't. Uh, I guess you could. You do could do it like here, but yes, it's not yeah. enjoyable to no, read. No, no, yeah. because you're going from yeah. one to. It's the not end that enjoyable to watch either. <laughs> but well, that film, <laughs> in terms of enjoyment, is really a question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. So, <laughs> it's not, I don't care. It's not one of my strengths. So, <laughs> no, I, I was going to go there. Yes, yeah, yeah. but but I want to get to Richard's question before we We're working do, with Cubby. Yeah, Hubert Selby Jr. was. I mean, I, I have a lot of stories about Selby, and I was just. I actually, well, this is like name dropping, and bragging. I, I was. Um, uh, I had a meal with Nick Cave, um, and uh, I was. We ended up talking about Selby because I figured they had run into each other, and. Um, he was like, he's not what you expected, which is what's really interesting about Selby is he was incredibly, you read his writing and he's so violent and, and so um, upsetting. You know, when I first met him, I actually cold called him. I called up the WGA, I was a st film student in LA and uh, the film school said, uh, choose some of your favorite authors, short stories and turn them into, we knew we had to make a bunch of short films. Mm -hmm. so. I just, I called the WGA and that's the type of guy he was. They gave me his phone number. I called him up, he said, ah, come on over. And um, he lived in LA at the time. And I was just expecting a huge, massive guy with an ax, you know, <laughs> ready to come in. And it was like, the, he was so skinny. He was like, a, he was a bean pole um, wearing a pair of whitey tighties and that was it. I was like, Darren, come on in. <laughs> And we hung out, and he handed me a poem. A, a, he, says he had just translated a Sun Tzu uh, poem from the Chinese. Uh -huh. He's like, I just translated this. And, and I was like, I just, it just made no sense. And I got out of there really quickly. <laughs> but over the years, I got to get to know him a lot more, luckily. And we ended up collaborating on the screenplay for Requiem. Um, How did you do that? I mean, he did. Well, he really, he wasn't. He was way. He was kind of past the place where he could collaborate. Um, and he was in LA, and I was in New York. I went into like hibernation in my mm. parents' basement, and I just started. To, and w the deal is, when he was in the '70s, when he was in bad shape and he was still on junk, he um, was paid like ten grand by some producer who who um, was worried about him to write a screenplay, and he's like. I think it's in my mom's basement. And I was like, well, I could really use it if you do it. Yeah. And unfortunately, his mom passed while I was writing it. And um, he had to clean up his mom's basement. And um, when he came out of the basement with the script and gave it to me, basically, the, the document I had made in his was almost exactly the same. We had sort of targeted on the same. So then I just sort of blended it up together. And then there were a few scenes that um, just didn't quite make, um, you know, when you cut a big novel down into a 90-page screenplay that you need to create some new bridges. So I'd ask him to write me some dialogue and stuff to do that. Um, it's a devastating movie. Yeah. And watching it twice, three times nearly killed me, mm. I must say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, really. It's, yeah. it's very, very hard. You keep hard. saying twice, three times. So does that mean two and a half? <laughs> <laughs> 
But the other thing I just wanted to say, <laughs> the, the other thing I wanted to say about Selby before we just finished, just to, because you had asked, was that um, um, I'm not good with my Buddhist characters, but uh, Ellen Burson always called him a bodhivita. Is that right? Which is not a Buddha, but someone who leads people to the light. And that's was I never really understood it. She, you know, because his stuff was so dark. But I, but at his memorial. When he passed, um, it was in the Egyptian in, in L.A., um, the amount of people he saved and helped through N.A. was just like they were lined up to talk about how he had helped all these people. And I think that's – and having you know all these years have done Requiem, that's the people that sort of respond to the material is, is, is what that did for them, that type of thing and what that was. You, so you it, I don't know if it's supposed to be entertaining. It's supposed to be kind of a um, – you know, uh, it's just supposed to go as, uh, you know, when they were talking, uh, when the studio was talking about cutting it to get an R rating, it was about, it, was, it, it wasn't a huge fight because it was clear to everyone that the more you cut out, the, you basically undermine the whole point of it because the point of it is how far dark we go to serve the, the, the addiction. Yeah, the addiction and the mother's addiction. Everyone's uh, addiction toward uh, using television. And it's very interesting the way in which you kind of e economically have the mother addicted to TV and the son in the very beginning selling the TV yeah. or p p hawking it so that he can buy drugs. And that relationship is, is carried mm. throughout the film. But I'm very curious, moving from Pi to Requiem with the four points of view, that's a huge Yeah, and leap. color. And color, <laughs> and beautiful color, yeah, yeah. and and used so imaginatively. Yeah. But what was that process like for you? I mean, making that change because each of the characters yeah. is so different. Well, there was a you know Pi. I didn't really you know my gaffer was um, you know a vegan from Bushwick who uh, <laughs> didn't really know the difference between positive and negative, and I'm serious about that. He really didn't actually understand. It was like. We were filming in the uh, in the uh, shul on Seventh um, and B. You know that oh, shul. Yes, that's yeah. a bunch of it's like four million dollar condos now. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. And the ba suddenly the lights went out. And the basement was flooded, and he was like walking through the flooded basement with two huge power cables. And I was like, probably not a good idea. I mean, I'm not an electrician, but um, and he was a vegan back then, which kind of can tell you a bit about his character. No one really knew what it was. Um, it, most people don't know what it is now, mm. but um, so uh, so having a real crew was amazing. So suddenly I had people that knew what the hell they were doing, um, and uh, and also working with great actors, having um, Ellen and Jennifer Connelly and Marlon Wayans and Jared Leto um, was just uh, it just changed everything. But there were so many ideas that I was playing with in black and white with no resources that suddenly I could really explore. So the hip hop montage, the quick cutting of, of repetition, which really worked well with the whole um, drug aesthetic, uh, the repetition of drug taking, um, I was able to really turn it into, a f I was able to create it, to finish it, you mm -hmm. know, the idea, to really explore it and take it to the next level of idea. Abatik, yeah. the uh, cinematographer, is ex extraordinary. And the way in which you use Brighton Beach, that all of those settings yeah. are also amazing. I, um, I just want to get back to the light <laughs> mm. and how uh, – and prohibition. Because the boy says that he can't look into the sun. Mm. And – there is in each of your films there seems to be a prohibition that gets broken, mm. and there are prohibitions between the mother and let's say the Jennifer Connelly's character who b begins to use her body for sex, and in some of the most harrowing scenes I think I've ever seen, and the way in which um, the Jared Leto character who loves his mother, uh, uh, in a sense, always is betraying her trust. It goes on and on. There's one prohibition after the other mm. that gets broken in this film and all of your films. Mm. 
You're not going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know. No, I mean, um, you know, uh, rules being meant to be broken or something? Is that what you're going for? Um, I'm, 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 I'm not I going know. for I, anything. I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I, I guess I always, uh, my heroes were always... Um, You know, growing up in you know growing up in Brooklyn back when Brooklyn was Brooklyn and not some creature that it's become <laughs> now, you know what it is now. Um, uh, you know, there were two types of people in Brooklyn: people who were going to stay in Brooklyn for the rest of their, their lives, um, and people who wanted to get to the big city. And I always wanted to get to the big city, um, <clears throat> and uh, and I think. Um, the, so I always had a taste for what other people didn't like. Um, my aesthetics were always from the underground. <clears throat> and uh, I, I, I remember I just early in high school there was this weird radio station. I don't even know what it is. Maybe someone in this room will remember what it is. It was some guy who just played track after track, and he recorded each week onto an audio tape, and then he would then play it and dump it onto the next one. And it, he just added layers upon layers upon layers of sound. So it was just this wall of sound. And I would, it was like midnight on Fridays, and I would listen to it. I just loved it. So I, I think I've always had this taste for that. And, um, you know, bumping into Spike Lee's She's Got a Habit at a, the one mall in Brooklyn and seeing that actually film could be something different uh, than, you know, the stuff that I had grown up on, which was sort of, the, luckily, I got a taste of the 70s, um, but mostly got the 80s type of cinema. I saw a bit of Spike uh, Lee in uh, Requiem. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, there was that interesting relationship. And what is it called, the Snorri camera? Or? He does it differently, Does actually. it differently. But, yeah, but I, ta I touch the bodies. He puts them on the dolly. Yeah. Um, but, but it had yeah. an amazing yeah, yeah. Uh, effect. Yeah. So anyway, it, it was... Um, I don't know. I think it was just always a taste for the underground. Maybe that sort of made me interested in sort of doing things a little differently. But I don't know. You also, I'm, again, those four different characters. It's not easy to create such distinct characters. Yeah. Well, and, they were and, they were very well scripted in the book. You know, um, it was it was risky though because there was. I remember uh, Tyrone C. Love is the name of the character. Um, so it was really it was written in the seventies, and it was Selby's sort of perception of race relations. The Jewish was Harry Goldfarb, and um, it was definitely when the script went out. I, I remember writing a, a note on the cover saying, "Listen, a lot of this dialogue is dated, but this is Selby's original writing, mm. and it's his poetry, it's his patois, it's the way he mm. hears language. I don't want to change it." So it's about seizing that. Because I, it was almost some of the language was on the edge of probably offending many different mm. ethnic groups, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, the drugs in in Requiem, of course, are not just heroin, but the the TV and uh, and her addiction to watching these game shows and to losing weight, so that when she wins. She can wear her red dress on, uh, on, and so they're 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 made a kind of parallel mm. story, and I was very interested in others of your films too, particularly the wrestler wrestler, um, how you use popular culture, it's uh it's differently used, it's more, um, it's from many other films I've seen or many other directors' use of popular culture where there's the, the tragic, uh, the tragic uh, component of po popular culture is always foregrounded, I think. And you do have uh, a real, I think, purchase on tragedy mm. in, in the, the Wrestler, in uh, Requiem, uh, Noah. I mean, all of your films, I think, have a lot to do with tragedy. I wondered if you, if there were works that you saw as a kid, or things that you were thinking about. How how that tragic 
point of view. Mm. Uh, I don't know, my, my take on tragedy, uh, you know, once again, I don't know where the dark slant comes from. I, I think it was, um, I, you know, it's, it's hard to self-analyze that far back. Uh, but definitely, um, you know, I can remember early empathy for um, the condition of the planet, if you will. You know, I growing up in, in like a place like where I grew up in South Brooklyn, it's a beach covered with trash. And so the contradiction was always there. And the co I lived near Coney Island, which was a huge aesthetic sort of um, monument because at that time it was a completely dead amusement park. And sort of the irony of a dead amusement park uh, you know, coupled with the, the beauty that, you know, the Lynchian beauty of the landscape um, and the big empty open, open spaces, I've just always, I've always liked it. And I don't know where that comes from. So it was you know. a sort of joining, in a way, of this kind of, the beauty was also tragic. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, but I, th it was just where my taste went. But it's funny, because it's like tragedy used to be, um, an accepted form of entertainment, you know, it's, it's, but we don't really do tragedy in Hollywood very well. It happens every once in a while, but it's not one of our, and no matter what, it always gets spoiled with some type of cherry on top or something good has to happen at the end. I know, I've wondered how you've been able to work well, out well, there. Well, <laughs> very, very hard. They don't really want to make them, but I actually think that by doing, by revealing the darkness, and this is definitely what Selby is all about, but by revealing the darkness, you're actually shining a huge light on everything. So by going through the experience of these dark characters, you're actually think, ref, able to reflect on choices you may make in your life. And that's, that's the gift of something like Requiem, um, is that it, it makes you kind of say, wow, if I had gone that way, then things might have gone this way. And, so, or, and maybe when I'm at that crossroad, I'll be able to think about it. So, I don't know, I, I think characters learning about that type of stuff. I mean, it, it's different because it changed in The Wrestler. That's not a yeah. straight up tragedy. There's, there's like a mythical heroism at the end. Um, and yet so. he dies. We know yeah. he's going to die. Yeah. And it, it's very striking that you, you I mean, it, there's an inevitability. I and mean, what it. else are you going to do with Mickey Rourke? You got to <laughs> kill him. <laughs> I don't know what I would do with Mickey Rourke. <laughs> <laughs> Mickey knows. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, you used, uh, for the wrestler, you used Maurice Alberti yeah. to shoot the film. She's a cinematographer, yeah. Yes, and she's known mostly for documentaries. Although she did do a lot of great independent film. Yes. So she was... Maddie, I think me and Maddie, were in, have, we had a divorce. That's my old DP, After the Fountain. It was time to take a break. Oh, from was that each other. The, that yeah, was the decision? Yeah, it was, it was to, you know, now we're back together, but it was like a, it was time to take a break. And um, he's a very emotional guy, and I'm a very emotional guy, and sometimes it doesn't. Always. Well, the Fountain is a very emotional film. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It is. Um, <laughs> and then, um, so she had done all these great films. She worked with Todd Haynes on um, Velvet Goldmine. Mm -hmm and she had worked with Todd Solon, so she had done these really great, beautiful, visual, independent films, and for the, I think she had a kid, so she started to work on docs because um, they were spread out over time and they weren't as intense, the shooting schedules, and she got sort of down that track and she did Crumb and she did all these beautiful looking documentaries, and she was just kind of done with doing doc and wanted to come back, and I got wind of it, so she was a perfect thing because I she always was wanted, absolutely perfect. Yeah, I always wanted to make it a documentary. The rest feel like a documentary, um, mm -hmm. very much like a cinema verite about about this character. The meaning of his life is his being a, a wrestler, being uh, uh, somebody who goes out and throws himself around and becomes king. And we see that in the uh, kind of the. Uh, from the credits on, uh, and then it says, I mean, at his, when he's at his top, mm. and then it says 20 years later. Yeah. And he, the first shot is of him, as I recall, mm. sitting in kind of a dressing room, and he's stooped over yeah. like this after a fight and unwrapping his 
his hands, and it's, you know, you are immediately in that moment yeah. of the, uh, of, an, of a sort of the penultimate. Yeah. The, uh, the has been. Yeah. And uh, again, this goes against the grain <laughs> of the American movie or the Hollywood movie. Anyway. Yeah. Well, we're closer to France than to LA. <laughs> I don't know. I you mean, mean here my, in New York? Yeah, here in New York, yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, my taste was always for, I, when I started to get, as I said, you know, I loved, I grew up um, waiting online to see E.T., um, skipping school to see the second Indiana Jones, and so I was totally the Star Wars generation of kids. But this is not Star Wars. No, no, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> but, um, but then I think something rang different when I saw when I started to see Spike's movie and Jim Jarmusch's films mm. and the, the birth of the American independent film, and that led me towards, um, you know, the beautiful thing is I also came to age when the video store was king, um, which is kind of a gift that um, this my generation of filmmakers mm. is starting to recognize was like this major thing because suddenly you can go in and get every Fellini film you can see. So I stumbled on Fellini and I stumbled on Kurosawa and, I st and that, they were all stumbles, you mm -hmm. know, it was like, Fellini probably there was a girl with big tits or something mm. that was what made me rent at that time. <laughs> Kurosawa was a badass samurai. You know, it was like you know, fifteen year old boy is yeah. what it was. So, but you ended up seeing films that you're not would never be exposed to in Brooklyn. You know, off mm. the beaten track. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the that was kind of the that was sort of the change was the video store. The look of the wrestler is so different. Yeah. from the two other films that we've been just discussing. Another thing that's really different, too, is the the way in which you handled the relationships that the wrestlers ran uh, has with his daughter and uh, with the woman he would like to be his girlfriend who works in a strip club. Yeah. And I th they're, they're two fully developed characters, both both of them, and they're, they're they come about, it seems, so, um, I don't know, so organically yeah. in, his, in his life, and yet both are so devastating, too. Yeah, I mean, they just sort of happen. I mean, the most exciting thing about that was the realization that of how thin the line between, you know, the life of a stripper and the life of a wrestler, that there's a lot of similarity from... Mm -hmm fake stage names to performance to um, spandex to, um, uh, you know, a love for heavy metal. Mm. I mean, it just went on and on. It was funny because Marissa and Mickey would fight over who gets to wear the cutoff gloves. <laughs> you know, it was like who gets to wear the rocker T-shirt, um, who gets what hairstyle. <laughs> you know, that was the arguments I had to deal with on set. But... Um, I hope they were amusing. It, they, well, yeah. They, they, they were, were They were hilari hilar hilarious. <laughs> but um, um, but I, that, that was always just such an interesting parallel between that, is that they both, they both had these characters that they played, and they did it, except one was doing it. One of them found the true art in it, and one of them saw it as um, a way to just make money, and sort of that was the debate that they had. It was easy to set up. When did, um, was, was it always written that he had a daughter? It was the script. I think early on we realized we needed something like that as much to humanize this character. And then we sort of, you know, through our research, we found that relationship a lot. And it was very interesting because these guys were really on the road. And being on the road and trying to have a family, the contradiction is very clear. And, um, so it was just, it was a cliche we kept running into. And one thing Covey, Hubert Selby used to say is it's called a cliche for a reason because it's often true, mm -hmm. um, which is something I, th I think about a lot. You know, you, it's, there's nothing wrong with a cliche. It's just how you execute it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I'd say, I'd probably argue that most of my plots are cliche. It's just a matter of how you tell the story. Now, wait a second. Yeah. I don't, well, let's go to the fountain. Well, there's nothing, that fountain. <laughs> that's, there's nothing cliche about that. But there that. is. I mean, ultimately, it's a very simple story about a guy trying to save his love. Well, that's... Uh, it's just told in a less traditional way. A much less traditional yeah. way. No, the heart of it, the reason that 
Lisa Phillips can watch it a million times, and I've watched it many two, times too. Two, maybe three times. No, two, too. maybe three. No, probably four or five. Okay, good, four or five. <laughs> and it's not easy to watch your films again, as I mentioned. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> not because they're not good, but yeah, because yeah. they are good. Yeah. Um, but the fountain is different because at the heart of it is this extraordinary love story. And I thought mm. to myself, this is the meaning of romance. What is romance but wanting to keep this person with you? And his, um, his path as a scientist is to find the cure for, for her kind of tumor. Brain kind tumor. of. I mean, that's sort of it, but it's, it's as much about saving himself. I mean, that, the, the true... The true emotional, because he loses her a long time ago, but he keeps going because he's afraid to die. That, that was, for me, that's the emotional height of the film is when he comes to terms with his death, mm -hmm. which is he actually says, I'm going to die into the camera or right off the lens. And that is, um, if you do watch the film for the fourth and a half time, <laughs> that you'll see that's the moment of the film where everything sort of shifts mm -hmm. when he comes to terms with his death. I mean, I think it was dramatized with uh, this love, um, and that is a big part of it, but it's really about um, living forever and yes. immortality. Yes. There was a, which a, is a selfish thing, and it's always selfish. Why? I don't know. I, a lot of vampire movies always deal with it, but it's like, what it, you know, at a certain point, it becomes, you know, a... It, 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 it's a personal thing. It's a personal fear you're fighting. But in Noah, think how yeah. old Methuselah was. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he had yeah, a yeah, lot yeah. of very old people in yeah, that yeah, film. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we didn't make them the biblical age, but we sort of, as old as we could. Yeah, yeah. You, that, that was, yeah. they were very old. But um, <laughs> I don't know. The selfishness about wanting to live forever uh, is it environmental because you're going to take up space that you shouldn't anymore and eat more than your Is that my issue with it? No. Oh. I mean, I'm just wondering. I'm raising some questions. I mean, I, I think it, it's interesting because it's becoming more and more acceptable. I mean, the cover, Time had a cover about this longevity movement, movements that are happening, and Google is now spending a fortune on it, and all these incredibly powerful rich boomers are now – starting to, I mean, the industry is just exploding. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, it was plastic surgery 10, 15 years ago, but now it's all about testosterone and hormone replacement and all different types of crazy stuff that's starting to come up. And it's, there's a lot of people out there that really believe they're going to curtail it and change it and fight it and all this stuff. And uh, what was most interesting is just how, how little the West does to come to terms with death as part of life. How it's, you know, we're, we're trained as kids to collect fall leaves and find the beauty in dead leaves, but we can't, we're never taught to find the beauty in old people. In fact, they're completely cut off from civilization to a large part and removed, you know, from Western homes and, you know, imprisoned to a certain extent and often abused I've been spending a lot of time in nursing homes for some other ideas, so it's really vicious. Is this part of maybe we want to talk about that? <laughs> but um, <coughs> won't go. But there. yeah, yeah. But um, so you know, and then you start to read a little, um, you know, uh, Eastern philosophy, and there's a lot of ideas about how it's part of life, and it's you know, it's like a yin yang. It's a balance of of coming to terms, and if there's anything The Fountain's about, it's about that, it's about the cycle of life and about the recycling of matter and energy, and... Um, there's so many different levels, yeah. though, with the conquistador. Well, it took us like eight years to make, so it was a lot of, um, we spent a lot of time thinking about it and trying to make everything have a reason. So everything does have a reason in that movie. No. I, could, I could show you any screw in any set and explain why we chose that color. But that was, uh, you know, I mean, we got really kind of crazy. I mean, we would set up, there was, the frames were so symmetrical and so set up. Uh, there was a bet I had with the first AC. I was like, we're off by, we're off by a bit. We're off by this. And it was like a distant. He's like, not a chance. And we bet a lot on it. <laughs> and we put tape measures, and I was right. But I got really into everything being 
like a painting as kind of composed as we could. Because when we finally got to make the film, I wanted to make it exactly how we had imagined it. But the, the, the imagining for me, I mean, I couldn't imagine making anything like that. I think that's part of the, um, part of why I was entranced by it because the, uh, the character that you, Jackman plays and sometimes he's shaved headed and sometimes he's not and sometimes he's in the scene with uh, his wife and the, all of these kinds of stories are happening in relationship and woven inside. So the real, there's, there's a reality, yeah. seemingly. And then there's the fantasy, several fantasies. Mm. And then you, sometimes you're inside out, and sometimes you're outside right. in. I, d I don't know how you made it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we carefully constructed, and then we tried to figure, you know, we tried to figure out as much visual, sonic ways of telling the story. But it was always about, it was always a puzzle box. Um, because once again, at the core of it, it's an incredibly simple story. Mm -hmm. um, and, but we wanted this sort of joy of watching it for the audience to sort of uncode it as they were watching it. And it's interesting because people, a lot of people, a lot of audiences didn't want to have it didn't want to really work that hard, which is fine and acceptable. Um, and then uh, also trying to make something commercial about death was a little bit maybe of a stretch. But um, yes, when it didn't have a lot of humor in yeah, it. Yeah, no, it doesn't have much humor. But it, <laughs> but it's all it's all constructed as a um, it's there's just a lot of clues that sort of lead together that hopefully come together at the end. But it, I mean the details of how we thought about it, like visually. <clears throat> there was always, I mean, it goes on and on, but it, it was from the future being all about circles because we were around planets and the circular ship, and then the present being about squares because we were in the rooms and uh, tables and computer screens are all squares, and then the Mayan times being about pyramids and triangles. Um, Patterns, like pi. Th and, but they all sort of interlocked and were interwoven together and hinting at the different time periods together to once again try to make a tapestry that made sense. So the thing is there's layers in there for people to enjoy. The beginning of the fountains starts with the, with the Bible, doesn't it? Uh, a, does it? I can't remember. It, I don't watch doesn't it anymore. Um, doesn't it might it have ha a quote. For, oh, yeah, it's yes, a quote from Genesis. That's right. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like Genesis. Yes, I know you do, and good, I reread re re it because of mythology. you. It was, it was fabulous yes. mythology. And, so they're cast out of the Garden of Eden, yeah. And uh, because they have eaten of the tree of knowledge, and what is emphasized in the fountain is the tree of life, which they have no access to, eternal life. This idea that there could be eternal life. Now that's really interesting. That the Bible presented metaphor, you know, as metaphor, uh, the tree of life. This yeah. Well, I think it, they were pretty good. I mean, when you look at it, when you look at, I mean, it's one of it is our oldest story mm -hmm. that we s are still telling. There's older stories, but this one we're recycling still. Um, and um, it's interesting how, and I think part of the reason is how good they were in sort of ki trying to sort of grapple with the human spirit um, and the human condition of, okay. What's, uh, what's different from us and animals? And I don't really believe this, but there's you know, a good argument about, okay, this idea of a difference between good and evil. Um, and, then, uh, and then sort of, okay, well, what's the difference between us and God and this question of immortality? And the thing is, the only thing that separates us from divinity is immortality. Is, it's an interesting, it's, it's a fun idea to play with. Mm -hmm. And can just lead to lots of ideas. And there's the prohibition again, too, that that returns in your films. I have to okay. remind you. I will be speaking <laughs> to, about it with a shrink in a couple of days. <laughs> I should hope so. <laughs> um, so, would you say uh, that uh, there was? I, I also looked at some Camus because of your films, and uh, he quotes 
Pindar at the beginning of the myth of Sisyphus. And it says, O oh my soul, do not but exhaust the limits of the possible. Mm. And I thought that was perfect for the fountain. I always like Camus. Oh, good. Uh, well, he likes you, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean. Um, I want to go on to Black Swan, which is another tragedy, mm. a, a different kind of tragedy, uh, I think. And it's the most sexual of your films. Yes, I think so. OK. <laughs> And I say it, so it must be true. Right? <laughs> no. um, when Nina, who's the ballerina, uh, it's, the film starts out, and uh, the risk of being repetitive, but I'll, I'll, I'll risk it. She's, there's the Garden of Eden. She's at home, and uh, she wakes up, and she's, uh, but she's had a dream in which she's dancing uh, the swan, and there's some horrific elements when the demon comes. But she wakes up and she's had this fantasy where she's the prima ballerina. And then she does her exercises and goes in for her breakfast that her mother has prepared for her. And her mother puts down in front of her half a grapefruit and a poached egg. And <laughs> You're definitely reading into it too much. No. <laughs> no. But no. I like it. Oh, no, no. I love no, it. No. Love it. Well, great. listen, I'll tell you that. Write a paper about that. I, I, look, I could. After, I mean, I've had this sort of crash course on your films. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and she says, Nina says to her mother, look how beautiful the yellow of the grapefruit uh, is. Meanwhile, the viewer is thinking, there's no food there. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> look how beautiful that is. And from that moment, that little Garden of Eden mm. moment, to, uh, to when she goes to her class, uh, a lot changes. Because in order to play the black swan, her, the choreographer, director, tells her she has to find her dark side. Mm. <laughs> you want me to say more about that? I don't that? know. What's the question? <laughs> well, OK. <laughs> Okay. The question, well, you say, I say it's a highly sexual movie yeah. in that she's asked to find that sexual side Absolutely, of herself. Yeah. She's, she plays, at the beginning, a, a, a very sheltered, yeah. very innocent <clears throat> Well, girl. it was very much, I mean, the metaphor of girl into woman was a big, big idea behind Black Swan. It's one of the big themes in, the, in it. You know, we always said it's like a coming-of-age story, except... American cinema mostly does coming of age about boys. You know, there's not many coming of age about girls. Um, so we always saw it that way. I mean, from casting of Natalie, who at that point people really perceived as a girl, um, even though I knew her as a woman, um, and realized that it wasn't um, that the film, the, the audience ha hadn't yet seen her as a grown up. Um, so. I mean, it, it, you know, we, there's lots of questions about the difference between a girl and a woman, and uh, clearly one of them is sex. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, uh, it, 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 and definitely in the ballet of Swan Lake, because for me, Black Swan really is a retelling of Swan Lake <coughs> as a narrative film, mm -hmm. even from the way the, the, if you listen to the score of Black Swan, it's structured the same way the score of Swan Lake is, it's just shorter, and then Clint Mansell, the composer, added some elements and twisted some elements and emphasized certain instruments, but it's really small. And when I went through the movie, I actually connected parts of the ballet to each scene. So I would, I would listen to Swan Lake over and over again, and then I'd say, oh, that music's good for this scene, and that music's good for this scene, and then I'd look at what was happening in the ballet and try to figure out how to use some of the choreography from those ballets in it. So. That, that's the story of an innocent white swan and, um, who falls in love with a prince and a evil sexualized black swan comes and swoops in and steals his love and his sex. Mm -hmm. So it was in the source material mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it was about bringing it to life. But th that, that's, that girl to woman thing is throughout even the color palette. She starts off in the pink jacket. You know, mm -hmm. we decided pink was the color of her childhood of innocence. Mm -hmm. Her room is grossly pink. 
Um, With all those stuffed animals. All the stuffed animals were definitely in the pink shades and all that. And it slowly she unleashes it, it gets rid of the pink and moves more and more towards the black. Her mother is a very complicated figure. Yeah. And uh, she was both in competition with her daughter right. and, and also wanted her daughter to do what she had There's not done. There's a few done. Re good reality shows that I think demonstrate the truth of that relationship. <laughs> what is stage moms or something? Yeah. Um, isn't there ballet, uh, ballet moms or something? No? Dance moms, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, but I mean, that's just a it, once again a cliche relationship. You know, you I, I can't tell you the. Uh, even, there were even some of the dancers in our movie who were women. They were twenty one, twenty two, who had their moms around, um, and they, it was just shocking that their these stage moms were still sort of hovering over their daughters, and they're often, you know, failed. Fail, they failed themselves in some way, either in the same art or in another one, and then they sort of kind of reminds hover me over. of tennis. Absolutely, yeah, you know, yeah, you yeah. have the tennis fathers and yeah. tennis mothers who were there, yeah. and look how unhappy some of those yeah. uh, great players were. Yeah, and Bar Barbara was great. You know, I was just when I was teaching today, someone was asking me about Barbara Hershey. Barbara Hershey, that performance when she's watching her daughter at the end, and how do you get that performance? Um, because she's sort of watching her daughter and amazed. And I was pointing out, we actually shot that before we shot anything else with Barbara. So she came in, na na not naked, but you know, no settling. And I stuck her in the audience. I said, you're going to watch the end of the ballet. And I'm sure she wasn't even watching Natalie do it. It was probably just a dancer dancing around. And this is sort of what you're going to be feeling. And so she really did a lot to, cons to walk that tightrope of... Um, you know, she was a shapeshifter. Mm. Do, is she a positive figure or not? You don't really know. It's it's from the very beginning of the film where you start with dream, with the, with the, with her having a dream, with Nina having the dream. It keeps going back and forth. Uh, at first, you don't really know if Nina is fantasizing or not, and as the film goes along, you realize that she is. Really. <laughs> You never did. No. I don't think. I don't think she's. I don't know if she's fantasizing. I mean, the the whole film, you know, it's not supposed to be real. Once again, it's supposed yeah. to be a ballet, mm -hmm. and they're never real. Ballets are even more unreal. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is so grand. All the poses. That was pretty good, huh? <laughs> all the poses are. Uh, <coughs> all the poses are so huge, and all the it's so over dramatic that we wanted to capture that kind but of what aesthetic. About, but but at the end, she has. The glass, the mirror, she has uh, stabbed well, I guess, herself. I guess it does get real at the end. Maybe. Yes, I mean, she... Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's the truth, yeah. Well, I maybe. don't know if it's yeah. the truth. Yeah, but it's, it's one of them. One, yeah. of the, one of the truths. Yeah. I and mean, it, it could also... I mean, yeah. it's interesting when you do something like that where the line of reality is, how real you're trying to make it. Because it was clearly a very stylized New York and a very stylized world, and yet the actors are acting truthful. So... You know, you just, and that's always a gamble. You're always hoping people are going to come along for the ride and be willing to go with it, and that's usually based on emotional truth from the actors. Mm -hmm. So if the actors are truthfully experiencing something, you can get away with a lot. That's how you get away with Lord of the Rings, you know, because the actors believe they're there, you know. Did and the you illusion is close enough that you go, okay, this is kind of true. Do you, did you st <coughs> study working with actors? Did you A lot. And did you yeah. take I studied, acting classes? I, I did it for, I, I, <laughs> when I, I never wanted to be in front of the camera. I never was interested in it. Um, but I realized it was probably something I should do. I avoided it through directing school, you know, doing it. So I took anonymously, I entered, uh, this is before Pi. It wasn't like I was um, hiding or anything. But I, I, didn't, I, I didn't tell people what I was doing. <laughs> I was just sort of anonymously, I, I, I joined a Meisner acting class, and I said, "I'm going to, I'm going to do this until I can cry in front of the audience unconsciously." Uh, which was the audience was the twelve other students, you know. <laughs> and I did that, and I quit the next day. What was what was the main thing you learned about acting yourself, for for working with other? I mean, I've actors. learned a lot of things, and by, and you work with every actor's got a million different ways to work with them, but. I guess I just wanted to feel what it was like to do it, 
you know what that state was that you enter where you're basically aware that there's all these people here but you're able to still have a conversation which is what actors are doing all the time there's a camera right here and there's all these people studying them and they have a pimple here and that person's got a booger hang on, and they got to unblock it and sort of go with it mm -hmm. you know whatever that that mental state of becoming unconscious in the moment and cre and to represent the emotion that's correct for the story is a very hard skill you well, know, not that I not yeah. that I want to compliment you too much, but you do you do work with actors beautifully. I Thank mean, you. you get incredible performances. Let's say from Jennifer Connelly in uh, in Requiem. It's and in Noah. And in Noah. Yeah. Both of those. That's yeah, great. But uh, yes, that was interesting. With Jennifer was to see because uh, we were apart for, I guess, uh, uh, thirteen years or something. And to s she when we when she was in Requiem she did great stuff but we had a there was a lot of ed editing involved because she was a younger actor and stuff and by the time I worked with her on Noah she was she's a true master now and that was impressive to me is that I didn't know that someone could change the level of their craft to that extent I guess it makes sense but. Mm -hmm. And I, I never witnessed it in acting firsthand. And it went from someone who had a, a tremendous raw talent and ability to someone who was, you know, a true master. Mm. That's where she is now. In uh, just going back to Black Swan <laughs> again, before we go uh, end with Noah, I guess. Right. Um, I thought Black Swan was also about making art. And uh, I don't know if your other films felt the, that The Wrestler you. was, too. The Wrestler also, yeah. in terms of his... Wrestling's an art. Right. I know it's hard to accept. No, no, I, I accept everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm thinking about the very end of uh, the Bla Bla of Black Swan. Remember when you you will remember, of course, when she's dying and she says, "This is um, I was perfect." Yeah. And that desire for perfection in in art, I thought was something that, uh, a quality in that film or that you were also yeah. speaking to? Well, I think it's something to strive towards is to, you know, in filmmaking it's about having every, I, I you know, I think the height of the art, it, of, of the art form of filmmaking is to have every element of the story and of the production pointing to the same idea and the same thematics. And you could see that, you know, there are, like, someone like Kurosawa and Fellini, to go back to the masters, are able to do that, you know, and, or get really damn close, mm -hmm. where every, every emotional choice is actually saying the same thematics of what the entire film is. So Marcello in La Dolce Vita is always this contradiction about, should I have a real life or should I go chase that hot girl? You know, that's, that's basically... The entire film did is about that. Every scene and every choice he makes is about that. Did you, you know? see one of F Fellini's latest, latest, late films? I, I'm not sure if it was his last one or where he has Anita Ekberg and Marcello Mastrioni look at themselves in eight oh and no. a half. I didn't see you that. You didn't see that? No, no. Oh, it's been amazing. It's ama it really is amazing. And, and so you watch this, you watch them watching this magnificent scene. And then he makes, uh, when it ends, he makes, he curses or says something very. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you, you, and you also see it with Kurosawa, you know, when you see Toshiro Mufuni as um, Yojimbo and every, every scene and every moment is, is the point of, um, it's been a long time, but it's sort of about, I guess, um, acting like you don't give a shit, but actually giving a shit and mm -hmm. doing the right thing. Trying to be this neutral, a, a ronin, a masterless samurai where you basically um, don't care, but then when it comes down to it, you're willing to risk everything. And that's in every moment of that performance as well. In, so. um, but just c to compare the wrestler and Black Swan in yeah. terms of art, uh, Nina's emphasis is on perfection. And you don't feel that the wrestler's emphasis is on perfection. No, but it's it's putting on a good show, and yeah. they they even have a term for it in uh, wrestling. I don't remember what it is. You know, they have like a whole carny language, and it's um, 
putting one over or something like that. But it's it's basically they want to make the crowd pop. Yeah. And there's an art of being a good guy and there's an art of being a bad guy. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, you know, is there the perfect performance? I'm sure those guys have a moment of highlight, but it's completely an art in the same way. But ballet is ballet is cursed by this idea of perfection, yeah. which is in the physical form of the dancer body to um, a, a, as well as uh, as well as the grace of it. And, but it could come in many ways. I mean, ballet does have room. You know, for Wendy Weiland, mm -hmm. uh, she w said Weiland. Weiland, yeah. You know, who has an uh, incredibly different, you know, physique than say like a Tyler Peck. They're completely different creatures, but they're both respected because something's coming out of them that's there. But most people would not see the difference. Mm -hmm. It takes mm -hmm. years of staring and getting a sense of what they're doing to see that. But so it's a very small window of what is considered good, and th and there's definitely this idea that you can have a perfect performance in that world. There's an, I just thought of another comparison between the wrestler and Black Swan Blood. He, yeah. he, he has that razor in his uh, hidden, and she picks at her yeah. skin and gets very bloody. Both things were extremely difficult to watch. Sorry. Uh, no, but... <laughs> you knew when they were coming by the second and a half time. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> No, I did. I yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. No, there are certain things I really because I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I I can faint actually. Yeah. Oh really? From but the blood can time? you you can watch those things easily? No, uh, <laughs> I when I if I see a needle going into an arm in a movie or anything, I'm the first one under the covers. But I what you did it. in Requiem with his arm—that's that, not my problem. That's your problem. <laughs> I know it's fake. I know how I did. It. I could watch that all day because I know how I did it, and I'm always oh. looking. How did I do it wrong? And it's actually there's a problem in that shot. You can see in the syringe, you actually see the needle retracting into the heroin. Yeah. Um, you know, I, we didn't, I, have, di I, I we didn't have digital fixes back then. I would have fixed that digitally. <laughs> a, digital but, yeah, fix. a digital fix. That's that's a nice irony. But um, no, I don't. I don't have a high tolerance for blood because I know how much it hurts. You know, but I think it's, you know, once again for me that that's exactly what the film was about is how far you go to do it, and so he's willing to inject into an open wound. And she, and uh, his mother. Well, hers is more of a mental whole yeah, thing, yeah. a transformation. That's like the werewolf part of the movie. Where, from taking those amphetamines to lose weight. Uh, uh, in Requiem. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, th that was the most interesting thing about the novel is that, it's funny, because when I, the, why I did Requiem for a Dream was not to tell a heroin movie, it was to tell the old lady's story. And, and the reason that was is because I, I, I love the counterpoint of the normal junkie story with that story to show that there's no difference between the dream of weight loss and being famous and being loved to getting high. Mm -hmm. you know, that, and that's kind of what was the beauty of that novel. And when they're high, they're always saying to each other, they're imagining these spectacular futures and yeah. they're going to get the, the pound and they're going to divide it up. Requiem and for a dream? Yes. I know, I got I that. <laughs> I remember that, the, but the two things about that story though, I remember being with Bob Shea who started New Line riding in uh, the back of his limo. I was like, just had done pie somehow. <laughs> he was like, you need a ride somewhere and I went with him. He said, that's the worst title for a movie, <laughs> which was kind of great to hear and it was a bad title, but I was like, it's the name of the book, what do you want me to do? And the other story was a big-time Hollywood director telling me, cut the old lady from the movie. No, really. <laughs> so it's like he can't really listen to that stuff. Yeah. I'm glad you didn't. Yeah. Just one last thing before we go to questions is just to talk a bit about Noah. You, you changed uh, the Bible. No, I didn't. <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. Because uh, in, in the Bible, uh, yeah. what, what happens in Noah is that he says he's going to kill the, uh, the rest of humankind, the, you know, who, the five of them that are left, that, it, that go on the boat. But, um, but that's not what it says in the Bible. He doesn't, God doesn't say he wants to kill them. Well, in the Bible, <laughs> you want to get into this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It's very strange because you talked about it. Man, 
man eats man and women eat from the tree of knowledge right. and they're sin they sin and they're they'll never be able to return to eden right and then they're kicked out of eden and the next story is the first murder right right very interesting they sin they're thrown out of eden first murder cain and abel cain and abel then there's a big time jump in the Bible. It goes forward 10 generations. It just tells you the names of all the generations. The begatting. The begatting, <laughs> right. He begat. And then 10 <laughs> generations later, Noah is born. And the world is described as a world that's corrupt and filled with violence. And it's so bad that it grieves God's heart and that he decides to destroy the world. So we decided to try and dramatize um, the grief of the heart of God. And it's a very, very hard thing to do, to show God grieving. So we decided to align Noah, his vessel, who basically executed and followed his plan, with that grief. We wanted to try and demonstrate what it meant for a father to kill his children, a father to basically create something, and then 10 generations decide to wipe it out. And because original sin existed on the ark, and continued and clearly exists in our world today. Um, it must have been something that went through God's mind, like, hmm, I wonder if this is going to happen again, you know? I know? Maybe Noah's better, you know? And when you actually look at the words in, 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 the, origi in the original text, it uses the word righteous to describe Noah. It right. says actually righteous in his time, which is sort of a qualifying thing on who he was. But... I don't care about in his time. But uh, what's interesting to me was what the word righteous meant. And the word righteous, when you talk to biblical scholars and you go into the etymology of the word, it's about a balance of justice and mercy. Um, and you could understand that as a parent. You know, If you're too just with a child, you can destroy them with strictness. And if you're too merciful, you spoil them. And so to become righteous, it's, a, it's figuring out that balance. And so for me, it was about sending Noah on a path of righteousness in the same way that God in the story sort of has his own path of righteousness where he starts off where only wanting justice. There's no mercy. And it ends with a story of mercy at the end with showing the rainbow. So we wanted to tell that story, but we wanted to personify it and put it into humans. And so what's the most hor horrific and horrible thing you can do as a father or as a grandfather? It's to kill your descendants and to end your line but so we wanted to put that logic into human terms mm -hmm. and 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 so the entire movie and i think the entire story of the true story of noah is about that grief about destroying your creation and it's summed up with the dagger over the twins heads yes and reminded me of um, a does Abraham. that make sense uh, well, we were they were hanging it. on your every word. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it reminded me of the uh, story in the Bible about Abraham and Isaac. Yeah. Well, that that's, moment. Uh, we felt like, you know what, there's only four chapters here. We, may, we can pu pull on biblical cliches and try to... I don't think try to these bring, are cliches. Well, they come up, They actually, they're pretty repetitive. Mm -hmm. The same ideas, mm -hmm. you know, God smites the world a few times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah, have, there's a lot of them. <laughs> so and it, and the characters get more and more developed as as the time goes by. But um, we just uh, I, I forgot where where I was going with it. But um, when you talked about Abraham and Isaac, it it was it's just something that sort of the whole idea of faith. Oh, that's what I wanted to talk about, which was the big point of it, which is like when you say you change the Bible. To me, it's like that's the one of the biggest issues we have in the world today is literalism and that there is more power in accepting these old books as mythology. Like the power of the Icarus story, which we all know is myth, mm -hmm. is still as powerful as any story in the Bible because we understand the idea of hubris of flying too high and you get burnt. And that instead of fighting over did it really happen or of course it didn't really happen. I mean, the atheists get into the same exact trap as anyone. Well, you couldn't fit that many animals on the boat. It's just nonsense. It, the thing to look at is 
this is a great mythical story, and it's one of our greatest stories that belongs to the entire world, no matter what your religion or beliefs are. And the fact that they sort of explained creation in seven days and almost got the order right, they screwed up plants and animals a little bit, and they you know, messed up, but they almost got it right, is a pretty impressive feat. Um, and so the fact that it is this great myth that belongs to everyone is why it's a great thing as a filmmaker and a storyteller to go back to these stories mm -hmm. and to use them to sort of um, talk about where we are today. And um, so that, that's, if I've moved the needle at all in the discussion for any people, I'm hoping that the rock monsters and the, you know, the psychedelic tea and all this stuff that sort of creates a mythical element for the Bible story helps to sort of push people away from it's got to be seven days because that's what you know if it's isis or if it's you know the heartland here it's kind of where the big battle is is to sort of you know let's leave that behind and ex except that there's lessons and morals from it but we don't have to live exactly by the word So now you'll take some questions from the audience, won't Please. you? Just raise your hand and I'll bring it to you. Or not. Richard, you have anything to ask? <laughs> um, obviously, when you were researching the wrestler, you probably know about all the wrestler deaths in the 80s and the 90s, horrible drugs and violence. I mean, t by the way, I was uh, teaching today and I was showing a scene from the wrestler and I was like, those two guys are dead. Uh, There's two guys in the film that are dead, you know, so yeah. it's happening today still, unfortunately. And, yeah, how much of that inspired you to do the film, if, if at all, and how much of it informed the character of Ram? Well, you sound like a wrestling fan. I was, yeah, in the 80s, well, yeah. Well, Jake the Snake was a big influence, and Jake the Snake actually has a daughter, um, and there was we heard a little bit about that. Jake the Snake was this great wrestler in the 80s that came out with a snake, and he was actually a terrible wrestler, but he had a great attitude. He had, like, a terrible body. <laughs> but he had a big snake, and, <laughs> and, and he was just a real big asshole, so he was great. Uh, but he's turned into, he's totally a liminal guy now. I think, he, I, I think he's pretty ill right now, actually. But we just kept running into the same story. It was funny, when we first started, I, I just wanted to do something in the wrestling world. Because I grew up, I was, as a teenager, I liked wrestling for like six months. And, uh, you know, it was cool and it was funny. And I was like, why has no one ever done a wrestling film? They've done a million boxing films. Why, you know, there must be something here. And, but everyone's like, it's a joke. Why would you even look at it? It's trash. It's, and the more I looked at it, the more of a universe I found. And, and then I'd just go to these events and meet the old legends that I knew as a kid and just see the shape they were in. And it was heartbreaking, you know. So, um, it just sort of became, it just grew on me, and, and, and then a drama slowly arose. I think the point is, what I've always talked about is that the beauty of filmmaking is that you can, you can enter the mind of a six-year-old Iranian girl, or you can enter the mind of an 80-year-old British gentleman if it's done correctly. That's, and so why can't you, why can't this really kind of repulsive character uh, that's doing something that's very meaningless becomes something very beautiful. So that was the goal of it. I am absolutely fascinated by your use of split screen in Requiem for a Dream. Uh, in, the beginning, in the beginning of the film. Um, at that moment, as student-like as it sounds, I knew I wanted to become a filmmaker. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, of course, after seeing the film, that sealed the deal. Um, <laughs> but I'm just wondering, um, and I've wondered for a long time, what the psychology was behind the decision-making of using the Did, split screen. I didn't talk about that, because we, Dylan, we talked about it in class today, right? I was just talking about this. Oh. I think it came out of reading the book. It was um, just uh, reading that opening of the book and having done the subject of filmmaking, and suddenly um, I had four characters that Hubert Selby Jr. was entering all their heads because he goes into all four characters deeply into their psychology. So 
part of the reason I wanted to do Requiem was because it was expanding on that palette of subjective filmmaking. But having the two leads in the opening scene, uh, I was like, how am I going to do this? And that was like an immediate idea, just from reading the book. And I remember just writing probably in the margin, split screen. And then it became something I knew I would have to use again, otherwise it would be a gimmick. Because when you start to set up film grammar and rules for your film, if you don't reuse them, they become it becomes a music video. It doesn't have a cohesiveness. So we tried to find other places in the film where it worked, not, com not as successfully as the opening scene, but enough so that it made the opening scene possible. And I, I just love the idea of like, look, steal, you know, one character being able to look through a peephole and then the other character experiencing it just made sense. Mm, that, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Um, Mr. Aronofsky, I have a question about the main characters of most of your films. I feel like they have obsessive or addictive personalities. Um, I'm wondering, is that a personal thing you put in your films? Uh, you know, we know directors put themselves in their characters. I, I'm wondering if, being a director, if you yourself feel you have a, a addictive or obsessive personality. I don't really understand the question. <laughs> I do, but I mean, you know, I, I, I think I, I don't know. I mean, you have to ask the people around me how much I drive them crazy, but. Um, Look, I think filmmaking is, uh, you, you definitely need to be pretty obsessive um, to get a film made. But that doesn't mean that you're obsessed all the time. It just, when, you're, when you get an idea, a billion people, well, maybe not a billion, but thousands of people will say no to you before it's done in all different types of way. So I think more than obsessive, it's some type of... Um, I, you know, what drives me is the passion of the characters. I mean, passion for the characters. The characters definitely don't have to be passionate. But passion for the characters, for the story, sometimes for a shot. You know, um, the first draft I wrote of The Fountain, uh, I pumped it out very quickly, and I wrote the scene of the flowers coming out of mm. um, his mouth, um, the, the conquistador's mouth, and him exploding with flowers. And I just knew... I just wanted to do it. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I wanted to see it done and execute it. So when I would feel, when the fifth person of that day said no, I remember doing that and get through it. So is that obsessiveness? I don't know. It's not, it's not like that's all you think about. There's, you know, you're thinking about so many other things, but it's obsessive to an idea and holding on to a project. I think that's a big part of it, is being steadfast with a project. So persistence, I think, is more. Thank you. Is that a good way to get out of that one? I wrote, I wrote <laughs> dope my way out of that one, right? You handled that beautifully. Come on. I get that question every time, so that's it. I, I just want to ask, uh, from here to where? What's next? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I just got over the hangover of Noah because you just you release those films and you sort of go into a quiet phase um, where you want nothing to do with nothing or whatever that means. Um, <laughs> and then um, so I'm just I finally am getting creative again and stuff's coming up. So it's like I, I just finished a big piece and now the next thing's coming. So I, but I, I actually know what it is, but I'm not talking about it yet. Okay. I, won't, I won't be talking about it for a while. Uh, there's a theme that I'm finding inescapable these days, which is that um, religion may be the most dangerous thing on earth. Um, there are people that are basically waking up and saying, okay, anybody who disagrees with me deserves to die violently. And you, every single day we see that. Um, and I would think that might enter your head when you were making Noah, because that's kind of what's part of in the background going on, like, okay, the ones are on the boat who get the message fine and everybody else is gone. Um, do you think that could have any influence on, like, I mean, a, 
a way. See, see the the, the, the the problem that I'm saying I have with Noah is that it's it's almost like it's validated. Like this is the Old Testament, so this is something people will accept. But have you considered anything like a story where um, things don't go? according to plan, and it turns out that religion is, in fact, a very dangerous idea. Well, you know, I, I, was, I got quoted as saying that it was the least biblical, biblical film ever made. And uh, kind of what I was saying is that um, we were trying to, kind of what the big speech I kind of said at the end of this, what we were trying to do is to recapture these stories away from true believers and say that they are our our stories, just like you look at Ulysses uh, and the Odyssey, um, and they belong to the world. And when you look at the history of these stories, it goes back past Judeo-Christian tradition. They were plagiarized from other cultures even. And um, so I tried as hard as possible to um, I don't, I don't, I mean, to, st to stay away from literalism and say that there is okay with interpreting this and making it our own. I don't think uh, anyone's going to use our, actually, this is completely untruthful, and I will tell you why in a second, but I was going to say, I don't think um, anyone's going to use Noah to recruit people to become true believers to go out and kill people, at least my Noah. No, I don't, I, I mean, it, that's definitely not the message of the film. We're talking about all these ideas about our responsibility to the planet and to, and to each other. You know, at least that's what we were going for. Although, I just found out that ISIS in their newsletter is using imagery from my movie no. uh, <laughs> to make a point, which is hilarious because we were banned from so many Muslim countries, and if they actually knew the source of the material, it would be hilarious. Um, but I, I, I think, um, I mean, it's a very tricky thing to walk into the world of religion because I've been hanging out. It's, it's kind of stunning with how much of the world actually will, would die for um, defending the validity of those words. So I think the fact that we kind of messed with it and brought in fa truthfully fantastical elements um, as well as a real big argument for Darwin, Darwinian theory in the film uh, is going to hopefully seep in and start to move the meter. I think people that go it's a very, very hard thing to completely remove religion. Even here's a New York crowd. There will be very, very true, very few true atheists that are willing to sort of surrender any belief in God in this room, I am sure of. Um, and uh, personally, I believe that, you know, religion is, a, is like a virus, and there are thinkers that talk about it that way that sort of, you know, when you think about it, it's like there's about as much evidence for God as there is for the tooth fairy. And I keep going back to that when I think about it. But so many people have a really hard time getting anywhere near any of that, that it's a slow conversation where you start to say, okay, so why are we fighting over seven days of evolution? And why are we sort of turning our back on Darwin? I mean, most of the most of America has turned their back on Darwin, which is just outrageous. It's outrageous. And the, the results of that is absolutely a, a disconnection from, from, from reality as well as a disconnection from our environment and our universe and our world and understanding our connection to the planet. Um, and so <laughs> it's a big battle and it's a big war and it's, it's about trying to communicate to as many people as you can to sort of say, um, let's start to take a few steps away from that sort of thing. But it's a much bigger conversation that we could go on for a long time. Does anyone want to kill me now, or am I okay <laughs> here? I think I'm well, we are going to end. Okay. <laughs> no. Richard, do you have a question? <laughs> I'm just going to say oh. thank you to Darren Aronofsky for being so honest. Uh, it was remarkable. I think you uh, really gave a lot away. 
<laughs> and I think we're all going to treasure that. And Lynn, I want to thank, thank you, you for your uh, incredible construction <laughs> of the narrative sequence. And uh, it was a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. If you're with the press, you're welcome to hang out. I think we may take a few more questions, but everyone else, thank you for coming. <laughs>